from Insipid Satan. Anonymous asks, do anorexics go past their calorie limit sometimes? Someone answers, yeah, it's an anorexic behavior to have calorie limits in the first place. Listless replies, drinking water is an anorexic behavior. What's your point? Tukino added, drinking coffee is also an anorexic behavior. Better have an intervention at Starbucks. Anon brings us, on top of not being ashamed, we should be grateful for the weight we gained during quarantine. Rainbow Dash replies, I lost 31 pounds since the pandemic began. I am no longer morbidly obese. My knees and ankles are very grateful. Faltiran brings us, the following was originally posted by the Fat Doctor on a fancy template in Instagram. Fatness is not a disease. Being fat is not a disorder of structure or function of the human body. It does not cause any symptoms. It's not an illness or a failure of health, and we've got to stop thinking of it that way. Weight loss isn't the answer. OCR Amazon replies, If you type something onto a fancy template and post it on Instagram, it automatically becomes true. Abraham Lincoln. Solaritas Lucis adds, Too bad Reddit doesn't allow fancy templates. Gandhi. Jerome A.K. brings us something else from the Fat Doctor UK. Just a friendly reminder that obesity is not caused by eating too much food. I know we've all been brainwashed into believing this nonsense, but there are anorexics who end up on life support after a period of starvation and still have a BMI over 30. Explain that. A bunch of numbers replies, no one is saying if you start from a high BMI and starve yourself that bad things won't happen. I don't understand her point at all. Beyond Che brings us, Calorie intake does not correspond to body size. You have a fundamental misunderstanding of a number that is not real. Calorie restriction leads to weight gain, so this is not an argument that holds up. Don't call me Cecilia replies, So you say, Calorie intake does not correspond to size, but restriction makes you gain weight, which indicates that calorie intake is still related to body size? Which one is it? Is it correlated or not? Make up your minds. Brought to us by Superb Ad. I feel bad for former fats. They feel attacked by conversations around thinness and anti-fatness because they don't realize they were coerced into weight loss and that the autonomy was stolen from them. Super sad. Abiel replies, Do the scooters extremely obese people use not count as having your autonomy stolen? Jeesh. That's more frightening than weight loss. Another from Superb Ad. Sorry, but when I see before and after weight loss images, I just think the person failed to handle the hardship of being fat in a fat-phobic world, and that's it. Transcendent Sea Witch replies, I failed to handle the hardships of dangerously high blood pressure and cholesterol, and I wasn't even fat. My highest BMI was 25, so I was just barely overweight but losing 35 pounds miraculously solved those issues. Judge My Face People brings us a tweet by Caroline Dooner, infamous for writing The Fudget Diet. Dieting is such an effective scam because the dieting itself makes you totally lose control around food and makes you feel like you need to diet even more. Axe Bomb replies, Caroline Dooner, Diets are such a scam. Also, Caroline Duner, I'm a self-proclaimed normal eating expert with zero psychology or nutrition expertise. I lost the rest of the post because the whole entry was deleted by the mods over at Fat Logic. Apparently, they didn't realize Caroline Duner is a public figure. From Sorgnot, this is an ad from back in the day. It's a picture of a person eating ice cream with a smile. The text says, Sugar can be the willpower you need to undereat. When you're hungry, it usually means your energy's down. By eating something with sugar in it, you can get your energy up fast. In fact, sugar is the fastest energy food around. And when your energy's up, there's a good chance you'll have the willpower to undereat at mealtimes. How's that for a sweet idea? Sugar, only 18 calories per teaspoon, and it's all energy. Apparently technically true, but wildly inaccurate ads have been around for a long time. From Lisa Daisy, 
I don't know who needs to hear this, but diet culture is gaslighting you to believe your cultural foods are unhealthy and that thinness equals health. Q without you replies, uh, I'm from Texas. My cultural food is bright yellow liquid cheese and sugar water. I'll stick to my diet, thanks. Still gonna eat pralines, though. I had to look up what pralines were. They're apparently turtles without the chocolate. For fun, I thought I'd show you some of my own cultural foods. You can try to guess what state I'm from. The first one is called hot dish locally. It's basically ground beef, tomato sauce, and noodles. The second one is cream soda. I know where I grew up is the center of all culture. This one comes to us from This Bleak World Alone. So I found out recently that someone posted a redacted version of my tweet from a few weeks ago to a community hostile to people of size on Reddit. It was truly hilarious to see all the comments from the rabid, holier-than-thou slaves to calories. So typical, laughing and crying, laughing and crying laughing and crying. Also, to all the mouth breathers saying, uh, what about the shot put, weightlifting, blah 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 that have people of size? Show me a commercial where a person of size is highlighted in a positive light, like they do with Simone Biles or Tom Daly, and you can't. I also love how all these small brain skinny minis just assume I'm just talking about the women at the Olympics when men of size have representation problems too, and they're supposed to be the tolerant ones. Okay, Karens. Rolling eyes, crying and laughing. Brett Thanos replies, I'd rather be a slave to calories than a prisoner to fat. I found some tweets this week from Mean Fat Girl. It seems that some of you may have been being naughty and going to harass her. Listen to these tweets. I block people for spamming me with links to scientific studies that I didn't ask for and that they clearly didn't read. Like, yes, Timothy, we all know Google Scholar exists. You aren't special. Like, B, do not come to me with your credentials and catch me on a bad day because I will make the time to embarrass you. You go watch all my videos first and check my sourcing, and then maybe we can talk. But the state of obesity research is so bad that there is literally no reason for me to respond to every bad statistical model. Anyway, don't go and harass her. No matter what evidence you present her, she's not going to believe you. And another one from Mean Fat Girl. If you're ever lost and in need of assistance, just say the following out loud. The reason why BMI is bad is not because it categorizes some people as fat. A thin person will immediately show up to sincerely tell you about a time BMI put a thin person in the fat category. Stop telling me about The Rock every time I bring up BMI, okay? The Rock is not going to be denied health care potentially to death because of his BMI. The Rock is going to be fine. You can stop worrying about him. Are thin people more concerned about Snapple cap facts about a wrestler? Than they are about people getting killed by medical fat phobia. Not a great look. Sad face. She realizes it's fat activists who bring up The Rock about BMI, right? Their evidence is BMI doesn't work because look at The Rock. He's thin but big. The following is quite the rabbit hole. It's Reagan Chastain posting on Instagram something that Christy Harrison tweeted that Reagan Chastain said. It seems the fat activist beast is now feeding on itself. Christy Harrison tweets, People of all sizes have knee pain, knee injuries, and mobility challenges, and being or becoming thinner is neither a sure preventative nor a sure cure. Reagan Chastain. This one comes to us from Dusty Buttocks. It's another Reagan post. If you shop in brick and mortar stores, imagine if you had to pay in full for every piece you want to try on, plus a try on surcharge. If you don't like it, the full price will be returned in a few weeks, but the surcharge won't. And you have to pay another surcharge because a piece didn't work for you. That's the experience many fat people have in order to buy clothes. OCR Amazon replies. If you don't run marathons, imagine paying a surcharge to run 26.2 miles and then another surcharge for gas money to drive to the start line. Then imagine if you can't go 26.2 miles, they still keep your money, plus you don't get a finisher medal. 
but they will let you into the medical tent for a bag of ice, and you can probably sneak one of the free finisher beers. That's what running a marathon is like. And another one from Reagan Chastain. If your brand offers larger sizes online but not in your stores, then at the very least, return shipping for larger size items should be free. You shouldn't exclude us from your brick and mortar experience and then punish us financially for the result of that. Building off my post from yesterday, besides just being unfairly overpriced, a major way that clothes for fat people become incredibly expensive is with shipping and returns. Even brands that offer larger sizes often leave us out of the store, looking at you Old Navy, and even stores that specifically cater to larger folks often keep their extended sizes only online. That's BS on its face. If you want fat money, you should welcome us into your store. Financially, it means that these folks of those sizes don't have the opportunity to go to the store and try a bunch of stuff on with good lighting and mirrors. Instead, we have to pay shipping for every item we want to try on, as well as loaning the store the full price of the item. Then we have to pay return shipping on every item that doesn't work for us and wait for a refund. Of course, this is made more difficult by the fact that sizing on larger sizes could be so very arbitrary. At the very least, these companies should make shipping for plus sizes free, since they've chosen to leave us out of their brick and mortar experience. She realizes that if they do that, then the price of all the clothes will go up even higher. The company is not going to absorb that cost. They're going to pass it on to the consumer, one way or another. All right, here's another one from Reagan. Someone says, just because almost everyone fails at dieting, that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Reagan replies, in fact, that's exactly what it means. Dieting is almost certain to fail, and that failure is independently associated with health risks. Much like you wouldn't jump out of a plane without a parachute, even though some people survive skydiving accidents, it doesn't make sense to risk your health to try dieting when there's almost no chance it will succeed. She writes a bunch of stuff and then she ends it with, To me, as a fan of logic and math. At that point, I just wanted to die. When has she ever used any logic or math? And I think we could safely add, when has she ever shown any reading skills to that list? The next one comes to us from Alfaba. It's another Reagan Chastain post. So many of what people claim are non-scale victories in their health journey are just a celebration of at least temporarily gaining thin privilege. If you are celebrating being able to do what fatter people cannot, you are celebrating other people's oppression. Do better. Cassis Oolong replies, Darn right I'm going to celebrate not choking in my sleep and waking up refreshed for once. No thanks to sleep apnea. If that oppresses you, I don't care. Bumble Bitney adds, Yep, makes perfect sense. How dare you be celebrating how oppressive your body was to your own body? The next one's from Elmir2000. This is another Reagan Chastain post. I gotta give it to her, she's very prolific. She doesn't have a high quality standard, but she does pump out a lot. Reminder to healthcare providers, telling fat people to try to lose weight instead of giving them the same intervention you would give a thin person is a dangerous form of malpractice that delays care and negatively impacts patient outcomes. Anne B. replies, There are so many medical issues that aren't cured with a quick fix. You manage symptoms until it resolves and hopefully prevent it from coming back. You don't want docs to jump to a more extreme fix, if something obvious will help. Weight loss can ease symptoms and prevent an issue from returning. It's common sense, not rocket science. This one comes from Reagan Chastain's blog. David's Bridal distributes unsolicited diet propaganda to plus-sized customers. A reader let me know about this TikTok where Stacy Sims discusses the email that she got from David's Bridal that was an advertisement for Weight Watchers. She talks about the fatphobic nature of the email and laments the fact that she can't return her dress to them since their return policy is seven days after a purchase, even though it took them six months to get the dress to her and to reveal themselves as a company that's willing to harm their fat customers for money. And good news, there's a follow-up, which is that David's bridal company got in contact with her and when they said it was in response to their customers wanting to work on wellness, she pushed back that weight loss has nothing to do with wellness. David's has agreed to return the dress, but not to end this toxic partnership. By the way, if this was really about wellness, then why did David's thin customers not receive this email? 
Does David's not want them to be well? A couple things in defense of David's bridal at this point, although they're probably obvious. Why would they send weight loss information to somebody at a healthy BMI? And people often want to look their best on their wedding day. She continues and eventually writes this sentence, apparently not realizing how ironic it is. Once a snake oil salesperson, always a snake oil salesperson. This one's from Lisa Daisy. The science behind intuitive eating and HAES. Albert Stunkard, 1958, wrote, Most obese persons will not stay in treatment for obesity. For some reason, they crossed off both the word obese and obesity, which makes the sentence make no sense anymore. Of those who stay in treatment, most will not lose weight, and of those who do lose weight, most will regain it. They have known since 1958 that diets don't work mad yet. Hagelpoise replies, Call me crazy, but most obese persons will not stay in treatment for obesity. Is Stunkard laying the blame squarely on obese people for not sticking to their diet? This one was brought to us by Skittery Hens. I've said this before, but it's been a while. Often suggesting weight loss as a solution to a perceived health problem or risk is the scientific equivalent of noticing that people with paler skin are more likely to get skin cancer and still suggesting that someone prevent cancer by going tanning and then if they do get cancer, blaming them for not tanning enough. Cool Rub replies, No, it's not. No one is going to tell you to get more sun to prevent skin cancer. They'll instead recommend sunblock, resting in the shade, and wearing protective clothing, because we know that helps, just like we know being in a healthy weight can fix or at least lessen some health problems. It would be more comparable to telling someone with BED to just eat more, because eventually they'll even themselves out, then saying they just aren't eating enough when it doesn't fix the problem, which is exactly what fat acceptance people do, by the way. From Fooking Fabulous Our bodies are like teenagers. The more we try to control them, the more they rebel. River Running replies, So the moral of the story is, we should let teenagers do whatever they want? Hmm? Brought to us by Gaming Fart O Kids. Lizzo Slander says a lot about the person because she has done nothing outside of existing. We say we want black women in all genres of music, but tear apart black women when they are fat. Fat phobia is anti-black AF. Clearly, it allows y'all to view certain people as less human. Ditz Jen replies, I'm black, and I hate it when I read that all black women want to be thick or obese. Not how I was raised. Smacksaw adds, I really don't agree with this American-centric view of blackness. There is diversity of size in Africa. Some groups value larger women. Heck, it's almost a fetish, and I disagree, because I find it to be misogynistic and objectifying, but that's another story. I don't think that example is super defendable. And there are other groups who don't give a poop or even have different ideals. The question is why these people are trying to erase the blackness of others for the benefit of their own. Blackness is about diversity, not erasing others in the community. I find it hypocritical that with all the repression and erasing that people of color have faced, that there are people who go, Well, sucks to be erased. Let's erase ourselves. If there was a way for people in power to oppress and keep people of color down, Having them do it to themselves and eat themselves alive from the inside sure sounds like a good plan. Flavor Rice brings us. This is from a post about getting down to a BMI of 26. I'm glad you're happy with yourself, but please, please, please don't put too much concern into your BMI weight. Look in the mirror and decide if you're happy with yourself. The BMI system is severely messed up. It doesn't take into account bone structure and development for women. My BMI is like 32 or something, which is considered obese. But I am curvy with a banging bod. I am athletic. Muscle weighs more than fat. I am not obese at all. But according to my BMI, I am. Don't base your worth happiness on a number. Congrats on getting better eating habits. But it stinks that your mom put you through that when you were younger. I continue to be horrified by stories of children being manipulated by their parents into unhealthy eating habits. I'm a little concerned about how much merit you put into BMI, though. Stay healthy and stay safe. Dangerous safety pin replies. For comparison, when Arnold Schwarzenegger won Mr. Olympia, he was six foot three and 225 pounds of pure muscle and a BMI of 28. So sure, your BMI of 32 is all muscle. Okay. Kai the Devourer adds, 
I have noticed that a lot of obese people have the opposite of body dysmorphia. So many of them reject BMI because reality hurts their feelings and they don't see themselves as obese. I had a morbidly obese friend who was shocked we didn't wear the same size. She truly thought she had a similar body to mine. She was a size 18, I was a size 8. Yes, a lot of thin people I know stress the fudge out over even the slightest bit of weight gain and think they are fat at a size 4. Tara Risen adds, a lot also have fitness dysmorphia. One that really stands out was someone posting about how fit they were and could run a 4-minute mile. Another person responded with the fastest mile ever recorded by a woman was 4 minutes and 12 seconds. This one comes to us from Arabian Nights. I'm determined to flame BMI to the ground. Who's with me? Drop a flame in the comments and tell me your story dealing with BMI. The obesity epidemic is being blatantly used to degrade and monetize the well-being of fat people and fat black folks. The fact that so many of us are under pressure by medical professionals to fit into this antiquated cookie-cutter chart is mind-blowing. To be denied medical treatment or have symptoms and concerns brushed off, to be put on weight loss drugs or diets even at very early ages because of their BMI is absurd. <sighs> Many of my clients were told that they had to deprive their bodies to hit a certain BMI milestones, or they would never be happy. Only as a result of following these diets and consuming this toxic mentality, they truly do become miserable. When they join my program, however, we let go of those harmful messages and begin building a positive relationship with food. The hours in a day don't have to drag on because you're waiting for your one liquid meal of the day. Heart. Reject those whitewashed nutritional standards and take that second spoonful of yams in confidence, sis. Clap. Apply for my coaching program. Alvenia replies, Don't let the healthcare professionals rob you blind. Let me rub you blind. This one comes to us from Fluffy Emotion. Instead of viewing potato chips as X calories, weight gain, junk, Try viewing potato chips as, yum, my favorite flavor. This is so satisfying. It's safe to say you've been victimized by diet culture. Pros Nyland replies, The following message is brought to you by the Frito-Lays Corporation. Do you struggle with unwanted thoughts related to the saturated fat in your snack foods? You're not alone. To combat those pesky little devils, you need fat activism, the solution for people who want to feel good about food that is barely fit for human consumption. From Boozo Boozo Boozo. It's using a Joker meme. Eat a double whopper and no one bats an eye. Fast for 16 hours. Everybody loses their minds. Blue Calcapot replies, And the fat people around you turn into experts about how not eating is bad for you. Blue as the sky brings us a picture of It's Still a Diet Bingo. There's 24 entries. I'm not going to read them all. But some of them are Demonizes fats. Demonizes processed foods. Demonizes sugar. Demonizes legumes. Demonizes packaged foods. Demonizes non-organic foods. Demonizes carbs. It also includes logging foods. Hyper-focused on micronutrients. Pre-weighing foods. Tracking macronutrients. Tracking calories. Kai the Devourer replies, They say you shouldn't judge other people for their size and what they eat. They say you don't owe anyone an explanation. Then why are they so concerned with people wanting to eat in moderation? Why do they care if someone wants to eat diets high in micronutrients? If you shouldn't judge someone for washing down a Big Mac with a large set of fries, then why is it okay to judge someone who measures out their portions and eats a diet high in micronutrients? Why is it okay to judge people for being thin? From Pragmatic Panda Thin privilege is never being denied the ability to immigrate due to your body size. Many countries have BMI or good health limitations on immigration that automatically exclude fat people. Privilege is unearned, but it's not something you need to feel bad or guilty about. Let's work to extend those privileges to the most marginalized bodies, too. Someone replies, Since you have limited your comment posts because you don't want to hear from someone who disagrees with you, BMI, immigration is not thin privilege. Countries that have universal health care systems don't want people who can impose excessive costs on their systems. That makes sense. I also had to get medical exams to ensure I was healthy when I immigrated to Canada. 
And do not say, but cancer HIV patients do not get this treatment. A, they do. B, getting cancer is most usually not your fault. BMI over 35, which is New Zealand's limit, is 99% your own doing. That's cute and all, but body size doesn't equal health and your concern trolling is tired and boring. I'm not concerned for your health. You do you. I'm explaining why these laws make sense and are not discriminatory. Lisa Daisy replies, as a New Zealander, I think I know WTF this poster is talking about. A woman had a BMI well above obese, 44 from memory, was refused permanent residency. She was already in New Zealand due to her weight. But she went all complaining and got her story on the media, then told everyone she had the same BMI as All Black, New Zealand's national rugby team, super professional athletes. We're in the top 10 for most obese nations in the world. We don't need extra strain on the health system. And it's not like she wasn't warned, and still, she made no effort. This one comes from Wild Aphrodite. BMI says I should weigh no more than 210. If any of you have ever seen me, you would know my frame at 210 would be incredibly underweight. Jason Blaha, is that you? Ancient Matter replies, It's easy to think that. I thought I'd look gaunt at 180 a year ago. I weigh less than 170 now, and I'm still a bit of a chonker. Mad Sai adds, I feel that. I used to think that 120 to 125 would look ghastly on me. But nope, that's actually healthy. That's well within reach for me now. But goodness, there was a time when I thought that was so underweight. From Lisa Daisy. Check, deprivation leads to a loss of control. X, lack of willpower isn't the problem. Biological drives are stronger than willpower, which only accounts for 1-4% to of BMI variance. Where the heck would a number like that come from? If you restrict, you will eventually eat in a way that feels out of control. That desperate consumption is your body's way of protecting you because it thinks there is a famine. Captain Tripps replies, This is true of those crazy crash diets. You know, eat nothing but 500 calories a day of cabbage soup, fart your way to thinness. A moderate calorie deficit will irritate you for a couple of weeks, and then you'll likely hardly notice it and realize you have a lot more energy. These two things are not the same. Slytherin Poet brings us, I'm so tired of twiggy, thin celebrities. Gain some fudging weight and stop giving the rest of us body image issues and eating disorders. Curious Chemicals replies, Look, it's one thing to criticize if someone maintains a body shape in an unhealthy way, but pretends they're healthy. That can set unrealistic expectations, but straight up, don't be thin, gain weight. GTFO. Seldom Seen Me adds, For me, that's a secondary issue. The main one is claiming your feelings and insecurities are other people's responsibility, and you can't do anything about it yourself. Not to mention if you don't want people, even doctors, to tell you to lose weight. You're in no position to tell others to gain. But I guess it's easier to blame, shame, and insult everyone else while you won't lift a finger to help yourself and claim you're the victim. From Fluffy Emotion a doctor who is relying on BMI to determine your health care may not be the best fit for you. Valkyrie Jen, who we haven't seen in a long while, replies, A stranger on social media trying to give you medical advice that they are not qualified to provide may not be the best source for you. Super Ad brings us, Quick question to anyone who still thinks it's important to lose weight for health reasons. 95% of intentional weight loss attempts fail to keep the weight off for two years, and over half of people who try end up gaining back more than they started with. If we had a cure for cancer that was only 5% effective, and over half of people who tried it got worse, would you stick to your point of view that you have to try in the name of health? Opal Teeth replies, It's very strange that FAs always use cancer as an analogy because they don't seem to realize they're comparing being fat to dying of cancer. They're literally comparing diet culture as the treatment, and suggesting that living with cancer is, is better than doing everything you can to, you know, not have cancer. Beyonce brings us, Once upon a time it was fat people eat too many cakes. Now it's, food suppliers make their cakes so cheap the fat people can't help but buy them. 
We haven't evolved. The tune may be a little different, but it's still the same song. People aren't fat because they eat too much. Whoever wrote that doesn't really understand the nuance of an argument. The first one is explaining why you personally are fat, and the second one's explaining why we as a society are fat. How is that not obvious? From GV Programmer. It's a sign, written in Spanish. I'll translate in a second. Lo llaman suerte, pero es constancia. Casalidad, pero es disciplina. Genética, pero es esfuerzo. Hopefully that wasn't too far off. Anyway, it says, They call it luck, but it's consistency. Chance, but it's discipline. Genetics, but it's effort. Cats with Hats replies with another quote. Luck is the last dying wish of those who want to believe that winning can happen by accident. Sweat, on the other hand, is for those who know it's a choice. Rainbow in the Sea brings us, I'm not going to lie, the worst part of body positivity movement is having to constantly coddle the feelings of people who fit all current beauty standards. Like, yes, I get that being a lithe, hairless, blonde nymphette. Hairless and blonde. With a button nose is very hard and your mom was mean, but shut the fudge up for a second. Carefree in my RV replies, not going to lie, the worst part of the body positivity movement is now that people are expected to coddle and praise my fatness, I'm now expected not to be snidely dismissive of my conventionally attractive friends and their problems because they're pretty. These HAES also worship women who meet every typical beauty standard except for being super fat. Hair done? Yep. Makeup? Yep. Nails? Yep. Wearing trendy clothes? Yep. All that influencer stuff, except somehow theirs is better because they're representing the fat? Yep. Holy Walnuts adds, Exactly, not to mention getting eyebrows done, fillers, Botox, etc. Not that there's anything wrong with that stuff, but try to have a consistent worldview. Come on. From Elmir 2000. There are many thin kids who subsist on candy and spend hours glued to the TV, but we aren't concerned for their health, and they don't get lectures at the doctor for their unhealthy habits. For some reason, we're only extremely concerned about the fat kids. Huh. Hello, fat phobia. Danimal Holocaust replies, They're only concerned with the kids who are sedentary and make bad eating choices to such a great extent that they develop health risks. Well, yeah. Nobody's saying you can't ever do those things, but if you mix them moderately into a healthy diet and exercise, it shouldn't be an issue. Ms. Beaver brings us. True, a calorie deficit will lead to weight loss. Also true, a calorie deficit is not sustainable in the long term. The body compensates by lowering its basal metabolic rate. The brain increases its hunger signals. Willpower is no match for evolution. Weight gain is inevitable. How can you say hashtag diets don't work when I lost X amount last time I went on one? Well, that kind of depends on what your definition of work is. Thanks, Bill Clinton. Short-term weight loss? Sure. Calorie deficits will almost certainly lead to this. Long-term? Almost certainly not. For lots of reasons. Complex ones that essentially come down to one thing. The body is not designed to lose weight. Weight loss is a sign of starvation, and the body does whatever it can to prevent this. Snide face. That's why you shouldn't diet. You should just make lifestyle changes, and they will lead to improved health and weight loss. Yes and no. Depends on what you mean by lifestyle changes. If you're talking about listening to your body, no longer restricting or pursuing weight loss or in learning body acceptance, then sure, but it won't necessarily lead to weight loss. It's still good for your health, though. Snide face, you just lack willpower. Willpower isn't an actual thing, you know that, right? What a strange thing to say. Maybe they meant to write, you shouldn't rely on willpower? I don't know. Snide face, you're just a bitter, lazy, fat person. Fudge you, buddy. You're darn right I'm bitter and angry. I'm sick of all the bigotry and body shaming, and I'm most definitely fat, but I am not lazy. That comment goes on the other hand. Lashing out and stating the obvious, that's about as lazy as it gets. Try harder. Why is she angry with the pretend person she's arguing with? Distressed with coffee replies, So much effort to avoid the simple, obvious truth. There is no spoon. No, wait, that's not it. Once you start putting extra food on your body again, you'll put the weight back on. No fudging poop. From Flavor Rice. 
I see this with so many fitness influencers who claim they eat intuitively, but openly track their food, talk about calorie swaps, and constantly promote weight loss. They claim to hate diet culture, but only hate it because it's promoting unhealthy ways of losing weight. Um, yeah? And not just the act of losing weight itself when it's not needed. Start strength training, cut out liquid calories, 10,000 steps, is all I hear from these people, but in the same sentence I hear that they healed their relationship with food. Recovering is not just about eating more. It's about giving yourself unconditional permission to eat what you want. No tracking, no cheats, etc. Your relationship with food isn't healed if you won't touch a drink because it has carbs in it and feel the need to be constantly moving, you're not intuitive. Saying you need to track to learn portion sizes and then eat intuitively is BS too. Sorry, that's my rant. Book Hermit replies, Strength training is good for all able people. Having an appropriate amount of muscle mass for your height and weight is protective of your endocrine system, joints, bones, and aging. Liquid calories in the form of soda and sugar syrup masquerading as coffee have zero nutrition and contribute to NAFLD. Moderation is good, and enjoying a liquid dessert is fun from time to time, but it's no way to hydrate. 10,000 steps is the bare minimum the ADA reckons they could convince Americans to do. It's not spending every spare minute exercising. It's taking a half-hour walk after two meals, combined with light housework. How can someone that has ignored hunger signals for years eat intuitively and keep up a healthy weight? Structure first, then intuition is incorporated later for long-term maintenance. They just need to say they feel guilty when they see someone else doing the bare minimum to be healthy, when they have zero interest in following their lead. It's all projection. Unclerical Stan brings us, You really don't have to exercise if you don't want to. It's a choice. You don't even need an explanation. You simply just ain't gotta want to do it. Remember that when people are posting mad to guilt and shame you into exercising. OCR Amazon the main problem is they think anyone posting about their own exercise routine is only doing so to guilt and shame fat people. Lisa Daisy brings us. Did you ever think about this? The healthcare provider who encouraged you to lose weight and focused on your weight as a measure of your progress may have their job security on the line. You trying to fit yourself into a smaller body may just be keeping them in their job. Peace Tea Time replies. This is completely backward. The hospitals make so much money off of obese people. While the actual nurse and doctors would be thrilled if you as a person were healthy because they're good people, the medical system employing them makes a staggering amount of money because of how obese and sick people are. These self-inflicted chronic problems, especially ones that can be treated through pharmaceuticals, are the proverbial cash cows. From BSing my way through life, somebody was suggesting to put calorie information onto food. You might have a point if calories were a real metric, but they aren't. Calorie intake does not correspond to body size. You have a fundamental misunderstanding of a number that is not real. Calorie restriction leads to weight gain, so this is not an argument that holds up. Horror Mixture replies, If calories aren't real, why is restricting them a problem? Super Ad brings us, Hi. After many years of dieting and fasting and restrictive eating, I decided to give it all up and adopt an anti-diet lifestyle. In doing so, I have gained 20 pounds in three months and I feel physically uncomfortable. Carrying the extra weight has made me feel unwell physically. I also feel sluggish even though I walk for an hour a day. I'm wondering if others felt this way when embarking on an anti-diet journey. I'm so tempted to go back to dieting just to feel physically better. However, emotionally, dieting is horrible. I've had to buy new clothes because nothing fits. It's just tough. I'm looking for any feedback or advice regarding the tough parts of this journey and how long I can expect them to last. Thank you. Someone replies, So much love to you. Three months is a very short time to get used to a new body size, especially in a culture that assigns moral value to size. You're still really, really new to all this, so it makes sense that you're struggling. When you say that you feel sluggish, the first place my brain goes is that this could be part of my emotional reaction to the lifestyle. I feel sluggish when I'm worried about a work deadline, when I'm not getting along with my husband, or generally feeling insecure. It wouldn't be surprising if you felt that way because of the emotional work of getting used to a different body size. But if you're worried about it, you could go in for a checkup with your physician. 
Best if you find an HAES friendly one. I know there are lists of such practitioners. Someone else. I find that physical discomfort is a fake thought for me. I'm really saying to myself, I don't want to look like this. And societal conditioning has taught me that fat people are uncomfortable. Right now, sitting here in clothes that fit, my boobs are kind of annoying me. But they always have been big for my body. That's just how I'm built. Just saying, physical discomfort could be a sign that you're just mentally uncomfortable. But I'm not in your body and absolutely won't tell you how to feel. Someone else. I think reframing is very helpful. The discomfort you have now is from changing. Change and growth are uncomfortable and painful sometimes, too. I hate change, even changes I chose for myself and was excited about. I always feel better once I acknowledge that change is hard and that there's no need for me to feel guilty or scared if I'm struggling in the moment. It's okay to feel terrified by weight gain. You've been told your whole life that weight gain is bad. A fourth person. When I feel sluggish, see, it's because I need a quick sugar fix. Was feeling blah, then drank my afternoon coffee, two sugar cubes, and a loft house cookie, and I'm ready to power through. Miss BB replies, This the gaslighting and misinformation. That being sluggish is because of society and work deadlines. That they are just getting used to their new size. That discomfort is a fake thought. The absolute delusional mentality. Just like a bucket of crabs dragging others down. I hope the original OP gets the help they actually need. From Lisa Daisy. Reason number one to stop hating fat bodies and engaging in dieting. Fat, phobia, and diet culture support many systems of oppression, and that's not okay. They support sexism, ableism, racism, ageism, classism, capitalism, transphobia, xenophobia, colonialism, healthism. Vital Musician replies, Colonialism and xenophobia, it's the opposite. Most other nations, especially underdeveloped ones, are actually getting harmed by the introduction of our dietary habits, read, obesogenic environment, to their cultures, not the introduction of fat phobia. Undoubtedly, most of them would think the entire idea of fat oppression to be absolutely laughable while they deal with food insecurity. Capitalism, it's the opposite. Because the tendency to consume more over time, like you would in order to increase your size over time, is the defining goal of capitalism. Sexism and racism, it's the opposite, because minorities are disproportionately affected by the negative impacts of obesity, and women are disproportionately affected by the lies spread by fat acceptance advocates. Ageism, it's the opposite, because most FAs tend to be younger because they have yet to suffer the negative consequences of chronic obesity and metabolic syndrome. Healthism. Health is objectively good, and there is nothing wrong with promoting it. Ever. This Murart reports in a conversation they had online. It's been proven that if you do a reduced calorie diet, your body thinks it's starving and switches to a storage mode. Like there's a switch on your back that switches you from one thing to another. And everything is stored as fat. Many people have this storage mode switched on all the time, no matter what they do or eat. Hawaiian archives have some great pictures of plus-sized people. Someone else. That's not true. We're here to look at awesome pictures and support each other. Starvation mode is a myth that would violate the laws of thermodynamics. I'm here to look at cool stuff, not read things that are triggering. Someone else. Not forgetting the genes of people who went through starvation are permanently changed, so their children have DNA with a predisposition to retain fat as a natural survival tactic of the human race. Kissian replied, We have long blown past the infamous 95% statistic. Now if you diet, you'll not only regain weight, but also make all of your descendants fat for at least seven generations. Muster brings us, On learning fit phobia, accepting your fat body, and deprogramming diet culture, hard as fudge. Getting to the end of your life and realizing you've spent it hating yourself, really, really, really hard as fudge. Parrot's carrot replies, Today I learned if you watch what you eat, or just don't want to be morbidly obese anymore, you hate yourself. Lisa Daisy brings us, The government has been behind eat less and exercise more, which not only fails over time, but backfires for over 95% of dieters. After numerous rounds of deprivation dieting, the formerly slightly chubby person usually ends up obese. The body fights back against deprivation by making one sluggish, tired, hungry, but amping up hormones that make one gain weight on fewer calories, 
by slowing one's metabolism and damaging one's mood, brain function, sleep quality, sex drive, and more. A healthy body regulates its own weight at a healthy level. Americans were pretty effortlessly slim until the late 1980s, when millions started blowing up like balloons almost overnight. That trend spread in the pattern of a virus across the country and to many other countries. What changed in the mid to late 1980s? Fix that and we restore our natural apostats. Yeah, they wrote apostats at the end. I don't think that's a real word, but maybe. Mustard Colonial replies, It's simple, then start eating like it's 1980. Go cook your own meals. Don't buy tons of sugar. Exercise like it's the 1980s golden era of bodybuilding and you will get there. The only person that can fix that are the people who refuse to do anything to fix anything. He forgot the most important part. Don't use a computer or your phone. This one comes to us from Love Dove Bunny. If anybody hasn't heard, or only knows part of it like me, blank now goes up to size 40. However, their brick and mortar stores still only go to size 28. When I heard that they'd gone to 40, I was ecstatic at the thought that I could try clothes on again for the first time in years. Nothing here goes above a 30, and even places like blank only carry up to a 28 in physical stores. I'm now a 32, 34, 36, depending on the cut, and I loathe not being able to try things on before I buy them. Personally, I find it more offensive that Blank now pretends to be accessible to superfat and infinifat people, but refuses to allow us in their stores. Dusty Buttocks replies, None of the stores carry my size. Is this a sign to change? No! It's the clothes who are wrong. From AM Hey, did you know words like overweight and obese are used to medicalize the conversation of fatness? and maximize fear. I'm once again a skin y'all to rub those last few brain cells together. Mm, think for yourselves. Suspicious Acadia replies, calling someone asthmatic is insulting and medicalizing their breathing just because they breathe differently to you and have to medicate. Sarcasm. In science, we recently learned that an analysis of data of 1.5 million people has identified 579 locations in the genome associated with predispositions to different behaviors and disorders related to self-regulation, including addiction and child behavioral problems, and definitely obesity. The reason I mention this is because of this quote from Tim Ferriss' 4-Hour Body, originally posted by Troopy. Eric Lander, leader of the Human Genome Project, has emphasized repeatedly the folly of learned helplessness through genetic determinism. People will think that because genes play a role in something, they determine everything. We see again and again people saying, It's all genetic. I can't do anything about it. That's nonsense. To say that something has a genetic component does not make it unchangeable. And now, Dechonkers. This one's brought to us by Vacuous. It's a black cat peeking over the edge of a bunk bed. My wonderful baby nine years old cat has lost another half a pound in the last month on her new diet from the vet. Is this too fast? Should I add a little back? details and comments. The next one's brought to us by Jin Wen Zhao. It's a multicolored cat. In the first picture he looks pretty chunky. In the second picture he looks slightly less chunky. He's carrying a little less fat around his neck. Christmas is down 4 pounds. 20 pounds to 16. The next one's from Jay is Gray. It's a white cat with some orange spots. In both pictures he looks about the same weight. Still a work in progress, but my girl Luna from May to August 2021. I guess they've probably lost some weight, but it's hard to tell in the pictures. From Rune and River. It's a picture of a white and gray cat. He's got a big gray patch on his back. In both pictures, he's just sitting on a scale, but not completely on it, so you can't tell how much he weighs. Update on Clovey. She has not lost any more weight this week. We are leaning toward her having diabetes if there's something wrong with her. We will find out Monday. From Cat Obsessed, it's a white cat with a few gray spots. The cat's laying around listlessly on the bed, perhaps sleeping. Advice to get this girl to play more. Ironically enough, the cat will probably play more after it loses weight, which will help it lose weight faster. Thank you to everyone who helps support me to make these videos, and to everybody who comes and watches. A special thanks goes out to Hannah McNally, Carl Williams, and Sarah Ahern for their generous support. That's the end of the video. If you liked it, consider clicking like and subscribe. If you really liked it, consider becoming a member. As always, there should be more Fat Logic videos every other Monday. 
and on the weekends I'll be looking at videos made by fat logicians.